Good evening and welcome to Last Orders with me, John Shires, and our panel of politicians. Coming up on tonight's programme, deal or no deal? If we get behind a deal, we can bring our country back together and seize the opportunities that lie ahead. The government must now withdraw this half-baked deal. It all started so well, but Theresa May woke up this morning to a political crisis. We'll ask what now for Brexit and indeed her government as it all threatens to hit the buffers. Plus... I think it's right that we take action because the government has failed to do that so dramatically. Cleaning up our city's polluted streets, another Yorkshire council announces plans to charge some drivers. But will it work? And in the week Gareth Southgate was made an honorary Yorkshireman, we'll ask our guests who they think should also be given such a prestigious honour. So let's introduce those guests. Joining me this evening are Mary Cray, the Labour MP for Wakefield, and the former Yorkshire MP and MEP, now Conservative peer, Lord Kirkup of Harrogate. Good evening to you both. Hello. Hello. Well, last night it seemed Theresa May had worked a miracle. 874 days after the country voted leave, the Cabinet at last agreed a Brexit deal. 24 hours later, both the deal and the Prime Minister are in serious trouble, threatened by Cabinet resignations, not least her own Brexit Secretary, Dominic Raab, and a huge backlash within her own party. And that's before she attempts the seemingly impossible task of getting her divorce deal through Parliament. But... In the House of Commons earlier today, she was defiant. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Voting against a deal would take us all back to square one. It would mean more uncertainty, more division, and a failure to deliver on the decision of the British people that we should leave the EU. If we get behind a deal, we can bring our country back together and seize the opportunities that lie ahead. And, Mr. Speaker, the British people want us to get this done and to get on with addressing the other issues they care about. People around the country will be feeling anxious this morning about the industries they work in, the jobs they hold, about the stability of their communities and their country. The government must now withdraw this half-baked deal, which is clear does not have the backing of the Cabinet, this Parliament or the country as a whole. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister now look the British people in the eye and admit that remaining in a customs union is in our national economic interest because without it we will be poorer as a country? Yeah. What if the Brexit Secretary is right? What, is, what if his resignation letter, his devastating resignation letter is correct? That we are likely or possibly going to be locked permanently in a backstop arrangement. We have actually given her an impossible task. We know increasingly in this country and in this House that there is no deal better than staying in the European yeah. Union. Yeah, the views of uh, some of the region's MPs there. Lord Kirkup, the Labour say the government is falling apart before our very eyes. It is, at the moment, as it stands, a complete shambles, isn't it? Well, I think what we're dealing with is a very controversial situation. Uh, I, I'm on record. I mean, I'm not denying the fact that I have always been a Remainer, and I, I remain a Remainer now. And I think the best interests of our country and indeed our region uh, are served by remaining within the EU. And so, therefore, I, it, there is a problem here. There, there's a great division as to whether or not we can get a deal like this, which actually does not just have disbenefit in it. And I think from a politician's point of view, doing anything that harms people, that makes things less certain for them, that makes their lives uh, more difficult and in economic terms makes things more difficult, is you have to think very carefully before you actually vote for something like that. And this uh, draft agreement does seem to give us an outcome which doesn't please anyone. It, it, it means that the controls of Europe remain in place, so the advantages to us of being able to be part of the discussions and so on are gone, um, but at the same time, we get no real advantages from this. And yet, Mary Cray, the PM says the deal does deliver on Brexit. The key issues, end to free movement, end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, less money sent to the EU. That is what people wanted. She says that deal 
delivers those key elements. Well, it doesn't, does it? Because it keeps us locked in. And if you read the draft agreement, it says, you know, um, the transition period, which can end in 20XX. And as Jeremy said, you know, that could mean that we're there till 2099. We could be there for the next 100 years. It's a a paying for the privilege of being in and giving up our seat at uh, round the table, making the rules that govern our economy. So the Prime Minister is presenting the British people with a false choice. It's either her dodgy deal or a hard de- uh, hard Brexit. And that is no choice at all. She let slip a third way, if you like, last night when she was outside uh, on the steps of number 10 because she said it's either this or a no-deal Brexit or no Brexit at all. And what was clear from the extraordinary, really historic scenes in the House today is that the, the uh, temperature has changed considerably. There is no support in the House for what she's presenting us with and that the mood is shifting very, very swiftly towards a people's vote where we take the deal that she has now negotiated and put it back to the British people. Let them take back control. Look, do you agree with that, that that a no Brexit at all is now back on the table? Uh, Well, inevitably it must be if there isn't support for this agreement. Uh, But what worries me about it, 549 pages of text about withdrawing, seven pages dealing with a future relationship with Europe. I have been fighting for the last, what, 15 years in Europe to get agreements on intelligence agency sharing, security matters, justice and so on. That to me is still absolutely vital and yet it's hardly mentioned in this at all. So how can you make a judgment as to whether this country will remain secure if we go ahead with such an agreement? I think that is now completely up in the air and I feel passionately that we need to be concerned about that. I read that. Um, I read the first 150 pages of the document last night. Well I can't admit to it, <laughs> but you know. And then there was a bit well of me that was like, "This thing might be dead before I've even read it." And and, and that is effectively where we are today. But the thing that really worried me was about access to EU databases and the mm. Schengen information database, That's the exactly um, the uh, sharing all the information with police forces across um, the European Union. And it says, "Yeah, we can pay and we can have access for one year after we leave." That's right. That is not mm. acceptable. Yeah, I drafted the Schengen information. But but there must be parts of it. As a Remainer, you'd want Britain to remain in some sort of free trade area. There is... There is provision for that, negotiation on a free trade area built into this. Presumably, you would go along with that part well, of it. W- one of the issues is, is the backstop agreement, and there was a lot of um, co- conversation about that and challenge to the Prime Minister in the Commons. But as, as Timothy says, there's very little about the future relationship. There's just a political declaration, square brackets, insert proper title of declaration here. You know, this is still very much a work in progress. We now face, um, you know... The The Prime Minister is going to go to Brussels to have a summit in the next couple of weeks. We'll see what um, the EU and the member states come back with on that. But really, when you have the Brexit Secretary, um, the Work and Pensions Secretary resigning, the Brexit Secretary resigns over a deal which he himself has negotiated, then we really are in Mm. through the looking glass politics. And we are facing a, a, a... crisis of historic proportions. Yes, but we can hardly blame the people who are watching us now and saying, look, I'm fed up with this, just get us out of this, get us out of Europe even, just get on with it. We're so bored with it. The trouble is we've spent nearly three years internal arguments going on, the proper deployment of areas of policy which are vital to the future of this country outside of the European question have not been developed or argued. I can't argue or haven't been able to argue with Mary and her friends you know, about the evils of socialism against my belief as a Conservative. That isn't happening anymore. We're stuck here with this ridiculous set of arguments, which is annoying everybody, sure. um, but n- it's not good for the country. Well, what okay. we've had is a cabinet that can't agree with itself. And we, you, Timothy's right, we haven't been able to talk about the evils of austerity either. Um, but well. what's clear is if you can't get the cabinet to agree with itself and the Tory party to agree with itself, they can't expect the country to get behind the deal uh, either. OK, we'll talk about what's uh, coming next in a moment. Let's uh, get some more on this from opposite sides of the political spectrum and the channel for that matter. In a moment, we'll hear from the Yorkshire Shapiro, who's leader of the Lib Dems in the Lords, but first Yorkshire UKIP MEP Mike Hookham. He gave us this reaction from the European Parliament in Strasbourg earlier today. She's betrayed the British fishermen. You know, we've got a a transition deal with no end date. Uh, We're going to have, you know, a free moment moment of people. Everything that the British people have voted for, 17.4 million people voted out of of this union, this uh, European Union, everything that they voted for has been betrayed. Nobody voted for this shambles. 
and that's why all the opinion polls now say across Yorkshire, across seats uh, which voted to leave at the time, that folk want a vote themselves. They've given up on the government. They don't think they're competent to do it. Uh, and they now say they want the choice. So to deny people a vote now is a denial of democracy. Now, he says Lord Kirkham is a denial of democracy. What about all those people, 17 point whatever it was, million, mm -hmm. who actually voted to leave? Well, they voted for something which they believed might occur if their votes were successful. The truth is that they're not going to get, they can't get what it is they thought they voted for. So if that isn't a sort of something where we need to readdress the matter, I don't know what is. We, we have a duty, and I mean, particularly Mary and her friends who are, I'm not elected, but they're elected, they're representatives. Now that's important because it keeps responsibility on their shoulders. They have to actually sort out the mess. They have to make sure that they are accountable to the people and doing something that is going to help the people, not harm them. So Mary Cray, what does happen next? You're elected. It's up I to you lot. Well, I don't think there's a single politician that was ever elected on a mandate to make their constituents poorer. And I've been very clear. Ever since I voted against Article 50, I was concerned that the Prime Minister had no plan, no negotiating mandate. I was concerned about a general election. All of those anxieties have proven to be the case. They all evolved as, as I was concerned they would. And um, t Timothy's right. I mean, the Brexit, the Brexit, um, the red bus promised us more money for the NHS. It promised taking back control. All of these things. The Brexit that was promised the British people cannot be delivered. And the Prime Minister said that on the floor of the House today. So the question is, it's either this botched, dodgy Brexit, which nobody can agree on, or bringing it back to the British people. And that's where I think it's going to end up. So in your opinion, we're near we're now nearer either a no deal or another referendum. There is no majority in Parliament for a damaging no deal Brexit. We are not going to push the British economy and push British public services over a cliff edge of no deal. That absolutely must not and cannot be allowed to happen. But again, you know, there's rumours of a leadership challenge against um, the Prime Minister, Jacob Rees-Mogg, standing up to her face and saying, why shouldn't I put my letter in today? Extraordinary scenes, really, in the Commons. And, you know, you have to feel, I feel a bit sorry for the Prime Minister because she's done the best that she could do given the hand that she was dealt and you know now she but the Brexiteers in the cabinet have run away from the mess they've created it's for them to change their minds. But the country is going to be split in two if there's any chance of another referendum it's going to split the well, country. Well I don't down quite share with Mary on this I'm not actually in favour of a second referendum because I think people are uh, pretty angry and irritated as but it if is. But Parliament didn't allow the people to have a second vote on the deal, then they would but be Mary, saying we voted Mary, for this. Mary, still, I think the major first. responsibility lies on the shoulders of the elected representatives in Parliament. But I have to say, as a former whip in the House of Commons, uh, I find the ill discipline within my party, and actually, fair, Mary, a little bit in yours too, I think that is unacceptable. With something that is so serious so strategically important to this country. Five ministers resigned before noon today. I mean, we don't know quite what will have, ha what will have happened by, by the time this is, this is broadcast, mm. but it's a, we are in extraordinary times. And for people to put their own po political careers before the interests of their constituents, I think, is unforgivable. But finally, and very briefly, mm, yes. it is, of course, the only topic in the Westminster bubble. But I can hear people screaming into their television oh. sets at the moment saying, make it stop, make it go away, do it's something. Angry. Get rid of it. That's exactly the point I was making just before. I mean, what about health service? What about transport? What about social affairs? What about our foreign affairs arrangements? What is going on around the rest of the world? For goodness sake, you know, we have been so absorbed with this internally, with personal ambitions and all the other terrible things as well, that really the people deserve better. So let's move on to another contentious topic, cleaning up the environment. Earlier this week, the city of Sheffield followed Leeds in announcing plans for a clean air zone. Lorries, buses and other high-polluting vehicles could be charged up to £50 a day to enter parts of Sheffield city centre, although private cars won't be affected. We know across the UK and across Sheffield as well, there's a huge 
public health crisis in terms of air pollution. We know in Sheffield that around 500 people a year die prematurely because of air pollution and we know it costs our economy about a quarter of a billion pounds as well. So there's a big challenge across the UK and in Sheffield as well in terms of air pollution and I think it's right that we take action because the government has failed to do that so dramatically. With the London congestion charge we do pass that on, on to uh, the customer but then having to add an, another charge for the Sheffield uh, clean air tax I think then the customers are going to be looking somewhere else and not come to Sheffield uh, for their business. Well, Mary Craig, you're the chair of the Commons Environmental Audit Committee. Presumably you're in favour of this. Absolutely. We did a huge inquiry uh, across the health, transport, environment and environmental audit committees on this very issue earlier this year. And it's always placed in a binary way. It's like winners and losers. But we are all losers with air pollution. And we have people suffering from congestive heart disease, lung disease, asthma, um, dying prematurely every year. 500 people, mm. that's 10 people a week, paying the price in Sheffield. And it's almost like um, we're saying, you know, their lives don't matter. What we need is cities where people can move, where people can breathe. And actually, I was talking to a, a doctor, a very eminent doctor last night, and he said, you know, the research, shows that if women cycle two miles a day, they reduce their risk of breast cancer by 19%. If there was a drug on, on the NHS that you could get that mm. reduced your risk of breast cancer by nearly 20%, we'd all be on it. And the, the thing is, the, the drug is exercise and it's, it's more difficult if we're fighting our way through traffic or if it's noisy and stressful environments and we don't feel safe taking our kids to school. But this is a result of seven years of government inactivity on air pollution. They've been taken to the European Court to the R High Court um, for their failure to uh, tackle Britain's deadly air. Look, Hickup, clean air zones for or against? Oh, I'm, I'm generally in favour of them, actually. I think particularly if you take a look at, I mean, Yorkshire cities have some of the worst, I'm afraid, levels of pollution of any cities in Britain. And uh, clearly that's bad for health. But I think we just have to look at it um, as objectively as possible in terms of the economic consequences. It's been, as one of, one of the people on your film just said. The both councils, uh, Leeds and Sheffield, have applied for £40 million worth of government funding. Mm. Um, they're not going to get it because the Leeds have already been told they're not going to get it, so Sheffield aren't going to get it either. I mean, if the government won't play ball with this, it's dead in the water, isn't it? Well, I think who pays, pays the cost of cleaning things up is an issue which obviously has to be dealt with between government, local authorities and, indeed, the people that actually operate the vehicles and, uh, and are part of the problem of pollution. I think that is a difficult one to, to determine, though I would encourage, I would certainly encourage the government to use as much of its budget or budget, uh, relevant budget to help out when cities are taking initiatives like this. But, Mary Kerr, there's going to be opposition to this from taxi drivers, from hauliers, because it's going to cost them more money to go into Sheffield and it's going to cost us, the consumers, more because we're going to have to pay more, aren't we? At the moment, those costs are being borne by the people whose lives are being disrupted by lung disease and by the NHS through um, a huge number of people dying prematurely each year. So the question is who pays? If you have the principle that the polluter pays, then you do have to put it back on to drivers. But I think it's down to all of us to rethink how we, how we move around our cities. So are there ways that we could do it with electric vehicles, electric bicycles? You know, my second car is an electric bicycle. We don't use our cars very much of the time. They spend a lot of time parked at stations, parked outside our house. They're a very inefficient use of resources. How do we regulate our buses better? In London, the mayor regulates the buses. He says, I need this many buses in this area and they've all got to be to this standard. The dirty buses outside London are cascaded down to Sheffield, Wakefield and Leeds. But that and requires we've got to get the dirty money. buses out. That requires government money because it's them who are going to provide the yeah. funding ultimately for that. It's what it? I think we need to do with something like this, though, is to look at it more broadly about areas rather than ring fencing money into certain departments because here dealing with this it isn't just an issue to do with the environment department it's to do with transport it's to do with the health service all these things link and I think there ought to be some more work done on those links because that would show you where it's useful to use money, government money, to do something like this. One of the simplest recommendations in our report was to actually put a sticker on the windscreen so that when people were buying new cars they could see the pollution levels.
levels that they were contributing to. It costs the government nothing, yep. it costs the, the industry nothing, but it empowers the consumer to make the right choices. Well, they have that, I think, in France at the moment. It was yeah. supposed to be coming in here, but I haven't seen it. I haven't yeah. been looking and at any new cars lately. As far as cycling is concerned, rather than you than me cycling around uh, Come with me, I'll, show you, I'll show you the safe bits. The hills of Sheffield. Anyway, <laughs> finally, for most of us lucky enough to be born in the broad acres, there's no such thing as an honorary Yorkshireman. You're either a Yorkshireman or you're not. Well, not any longer, because earlier this week the title of honorary Yorkshireman was bestowed on a man from Watford who's lived in the county near Harrogate, to be precise, for a mere 17 years. Mind you, he is the current England football manager. I'm here to present you with this award as an honorary Yorkshireman, Gareth. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very proud and very honoured. Um, as you say, we've, I've lived here longer than I've lived in any other part of the country, so um, the values and the, um, uh, the uh, mentality of the people and the, w the friendliness of the people has been incredible. And um, so we, we love living here. Um, I've, I've thoroughly uh, embraced Yorkshire life, and um, it's nice that... Uh, yeah, to be recognised in that way, I'm very proud. Actually, Gareth is the third man to get the honour after Gary Barlow and Tim Firth, the co-writers of Calendar Girls, the music. So, uh, the musical. So, my question to finish to both of you tonight is: Who would you make an honorary Yorkshire man or woman? Or woman. Well, my vote goes to Carolyn Harris. Uh, she's my colleague from Wales, and she has been instrumental in the government's climb down on fixed odds betting terminals. And we had that little victory yesterday before the whole Brexit shenanigans broke. Um, that she is going to save lives with what she's done. She's been a brilliant campaigner. She's a great woman, and I think she deserves a big pat on the back for what she's done. By the way, I'm not sure either of you qualified to, to answer this no. question. No. Because you were born in Coventry. Lord Kirk, you're a Geordie, but yes. who would you... Well, I was going to nominate a Geordie, actually, who's lived in Yorkshire, been involved in Yorkshire politics for over 30 years. And um, he's a very modest sort of chap, um, rides a bicycle occasionally, behaves himself most of the time, and uh, appears occasionally on this programme. You. Who is that? Me. <laughs> <laughs> no false modesty there. Well, if, you don't, modesty. If, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> I thought you were going, going to say Lord Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> no Do, such luck. Generally, it, I mean, it, this is obviously uh, you know, a boost for... They're trying to get tourism, aren't they? they it just put things into the public eye. Absolutely. And we've got so many wonderful things um, in Yorkshire to offer. I was at um, the uh, Hepworth in Wakefield, a brilliant exhibition launching there. Yeah. Next year is going to be the year of sculpture with Yorkshire Sculpture yes, yes. Park. So we, we've got an amazing offer in Wakefield. OK, I agree well, with you. as the only Yorkshireman in the studio, I'm really not sure about this at all. <laughs> but uh, that's it for tonight. Thanks again to both my guests. We're back next month when, when we might, just might, be a little nearer to knowing what Brexit and the political landscape might look like. But now, have a very good night, if you can.